Hello, welcome and good morning. Welcome back to our Wednesday sessions in English. Thanks to American Friends of the Prada Museum. As you know, once a week we're guests on the social media programming to help share this wonderful art legacy with those who don't speak Spanish. And this is thanks to the support and collaboration of American Friends, and we encourage you to help us in this mission. And also think about joining our sister organization in Spain, the Fundación Amigos. Um, this week is kind of special because, as you know, as communicators, we prepare this session uh, in advance. And this week I picked out a work that to me is fascinating and makes me have lots of questions. It is considered an archetype of the Spanish still life painted by Francisco de Surbaran. And what's interesting about it is it is an arresting enigma. It is a still life, but without any fruits, flowers, any symbols of time. And that makes it actually the exception to the Spanish still life. And I can imagine the viewer, or myself, actually sitting in front of this painting for hours on end, contemplating um, what is it? What is the meaning behind it? And, and so I've been, I've been speaking this week to the specialist here at the museum about this painting. And I still have a lot of questions, but I'll share what we've learned so far. So this is uh, painted in 1650 by the painter Francisco de Surbaran, and we'll see, we'll see the, the wall panel. Francisco de Surbaran was absolutely contemporary with Velázquez. They were born almost in the same year. They actually died in the same decade. They were both trained in Seville and are representatives of the Sevillian school at certain points in their life, especially Surbaran. And, but Surbaran had a very different career. He, um, he's known as the great painter of the monastic life. He had great clientele between the religious orders and he painted miracles and saints in mystic religious moments uh, with extreme simplicity and candor and in a very realistic sense. And so Spain is at a, a very fervent religious moment with the counter-reformation in response to the Protestant Reformation. And here we have this different example of a still life. So it's not uh, in the joining rooms here at the Prado, we have other examples of Surbaran, of saints, of uh, leaders of religious orders. But here we have a very quiet still life. And we don't know very much about who he painted this for. It joins the Prado's collection as an art legacy from a very important um, art collection made on purpose by a Spanish politician and leader, Francis Cambo, who created a collection to supplement the Prado on purpose. I mean, so it's very interesting, his, his legacy. And this was in 1940. So we know that 100 years ago, this painting was very much in vogue and the archetype of, of Spanish still life. What we see is how Surbaran is painting is that he's painting four vessels that are set out on a shelf or a small stage. And we see, we see the four, if we start from the left, a pewter plate with a golden goblet. All of this on the shelf with a very dark, striking background, which they jump out at in front of. This is also the next piece is of a ceramic that's famous for, from Triana, which is the area in Seville. This famous type of eggshell uh, type of ceramics called eggshell because it was porous and it cooled water. 
and very interesting next to it is a work that was probably from the New World, uh, from the Viceroyalty of Spain. So ceramics that could be from the Tonala region of Jalisco, Mexico. Uh, and next to it, another work by Triana on a pewter plate. So the essence of the painting are these objects that are absolutely mundane and inanimate, but I have the suspicion that there's something sacred behind it. <laughs> and this is what I've been trying to find out all, all in my investigation about this painting. Surbaran, uh, his technique is that he paints a, a general uh, first layer of color, and then he outlines each object and paints on them. And it seems that he studied each one and painted them individually so that the shadows don't exactly represent reality. Like this pewter plate here has a shadow that runs to the right, but the jug from Triana, the shadow moves backwards in a different way, which wouldn't correspond as if the, night, the light were natural. And this is almost seems to be on purpose. Uh, so that we can observe and each object as it comes out of us from the, the unknown background. And if we compare the first pewter plate with the second pewter plate, they have uh, this beautiful light that comes from the right-hand side of the pewter plate, which also doesn't correspond with the rest of the painting. And the darkness here on the left side, which gives us the full volume of this painting the full volume of the object. So what is characteristic, and I'm going to talk a little bit about the geometry of the whole painting, is very balanced, very balanced on this, it creates horizontal planes with the shelf, the front line in the front, the back line of the shelf in the back, that creates those planes in the two dimension of the canvas, creating the three dimensions, and the parallelism between the two pewter saucers on the edges, how they balance out, and the two center vessels. There would be a center circle here and the exact line in the middle. So it's absolutely geometrically balanced with these little anomalies in the shadows and how each one is put together. And that, what makes me believe, should we be thinking not only of you know, what is the viewer, what would the viewer be seeing in 1650 compared to what we're seeing as modern, modern viewers? I mean, I think of a visual poem. Is it a treatise on religion? Is it our existence? What it is is amazing. <laughs> and it's Surbanan's technique, how he outlines each object to make them stand out and that they exist, they're here. Thanks to the light, the protagonist of the light. The light is what to us is the essence of the passing of time. The light that's shining on each object. And then also, this has been considered an austere, uh, pared down still life, whereas really these objects are very high end. It's a moment of beginning of international commerce and travelers of the time that are bringing this ceramics from the New World back to, to the Iberian Peninsula through the port of, of Seville. Uh, the golden goblet would have been very expensive. The pewter plates, these are more, more than objects that belong in a kitchen. There are much more objects that would belong at the opening of a house to show a certain wealth uh, to visitors. So it's interesting that we think this is austere, but it's actually quite luxurious. And so I, I'm going to have to keep continuing on our investigation, but invite all of you to come to, come to the Prado to see this still life, how it compares. There's no flowers, fruits, foodstuffs whereas the rest of the still lives of the time are filled with these elements and are, seem to be much more typical.
And so this work, which seems to be considered the archetype, the type of Spanish still life, is actually very special and very different. And another great work here at the Prada Museum. So thank you for being with us this morning and thank you for supporting us, American Friends of the Prada Museum and Amigos del Museo de Prado. And thank you for the, for the Prada Museum that collaborates with us so much to help us uh, help each other. Have a good day. Thank you.